All right. Hey, everybody, welcome to Real Live Talk. I'm your host, Duke Lamastra, and I'm so excited that you're here. So thanks so much for taking the time to catch this episode, whether you're watching live or listening later. Really, really appreciate you. My guest for today is James Harrington. James is the founder of the Ugandan Water Project, where he spent the last 14 years leading a dynamic team to leverage innovation and disruption to battle the water crisis in Uganda. The Ugandan Water Project exists to see Uganda as a nation liberated from the bondage of waterborne disease and poverty as communities leverage the transformative power of clean water to empower all people to live the lives they were created for. Wow. Uh, James, <laughs> really, really appreciate you, man. Thank you so much for being here. I, I wanted to have you on the program because um, I'm I'm just I'm so moved by what you and what your organization do. And uh, I think that so many, uh, so many people, particularly in the Western world, just really probably are unaware of at least the extent of the water crisis that's really, you know, facing the world today. And, uh, you know, you guys are in the business of saving lives and you're a hero in my book for real. And uh, I'm so honored to have you on the program. So thank you, man. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Duke. It's good to be with you. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, uh, listen, t tell us uh, just a little bit about, um, gave a little bit of an intro and I was just reading from your website. <laughs> I wasn't just yeah. making that stuff up, but, uh, but tell us a little bit about the Ugandan water project and what it's all about. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was, uh, May of 2007. I ended up at a neighbor's barbecue and, uh, you know, just open invite and ended up sitting down and there was a, a gentleman who had come over from Uganda. He's a, he's a pastor and a, a school director. And he was in the U.S. for a leadership conference, and I ended up sitting next to him at this barbecue. And I've always loved other cultures, so uh, just you know, trying to look at our lives together and enjoy the the commonality of human experience as well as the diversity of our two lives. And in that first conversation, one of the things that really jumped out to me was just hearing him talk about how life in Uganda and the general context for him growing up, for his kids, and many of the people in his classrooms and congregations, some of their basic needs really are uh, dominant in their lives. And one of those is, is clean water. And that really mm -hmm. got my attention. And uh, I was I was really curious. I was bothered in a very productive way and really wanted to know more. And so basically over the next six to eight months was just really building that connection with him and educating myself and really saw very quickly like, the water crisis is pervasive, but it's solvable. This is not one of those mm. uh, incurable, weird tropical diseases. It's not trying to land a person on Mars. This is something that we know how to do. And uh, and so I really felt, hey, there's there's probably something that me and the people that I'm you know, connected to could probably do to make a difference. So even out of that first conversation, it was about a year later, found ourselves in Uganda. We'd raise some money. We'd put this idea together to do rainwater systems for uh, community buildings like schools and churches and clinics. And we saw the first two systems go on and mm. had a front row seat to understanding, oh my goodness, this is so much bigger than what I thought. You know what it's like? You know, I, 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 I keep my keys in my pocket. You know, I have, I have this key. This key, uh, this is a key to our church, actually. Uh, and we we have some things stored in the basement of our church but i realized at one point this actually opens more doors than just that storage room um and i try to behave <laughs> myself and not open too many doors <laughs> but when you when you have that moment you realize oh this opens more doors mm. that's what it was like the first day on walakubu road in jinja uganda when i was talking to the community and the pastor at this little rural church and realized oh when we provide this water system it unlocks education, opportunities for women yes. and girls, job security. It fights crime, obviously health. I mean, it's an economic driver. I just realized I'm like, oh my gosh, this mm -hmm. key opens so many doors. So that was that was the uh, the seed that started it all was was that barbecue and those first uh, couple projects back in the projects were in August of 2008. Wow. Yeah. And that's something that I think that uh, most people don't realize. I know I didn't realize it for a long time until pretty recently, actually, where, you know, it's not just an issue of there's no water. So there's going to be dehydration. Like, like, of course, like it's the, 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 
the basic, the immediate health needs are, you know, we could probably say they're the most important, but, but yeah, like when you open up, like there's a clean water source in your community where now as like a young girl, we can get into, into some of this stuff, you know, as far yeah. as what you, what you've seen and what you've experienced there firsthand. But like as a young girl, you know, so many times they're the ones, it's the, it's the girls and the, and the women that are responsible, right. For right. going and, f and getting the water. And so for some people, that's hours a day of taking a trip. So for a young girl, that might mean not being able to go to school Absolutely. and not being able to get an education uh, because she's got to focus on making sure that there's water for the family for the evening time, um, you know, so they can have something to drink, cook the food, whatever, whatever that is being used for. And, um, you know, it's, it's just in incredible to think about um, the impact of that that just providing a resource that we take it take for granted every single day of our lives you know we yeah. waste so much of it every single day of our lives i mean not a lot of us do i know i do and uh, but the the impact that it can have on somebody's entire transformation um it's just incredible so like what was that like the first time that you went to africa or that you went to Uganda um, after this. When, when was this, by the way? When you when when you were at that barbecue? What like how long? Yeah, so that was about, that was May of two thousand seven. May of two thousand seven okay. was when I first uh, connected and first started thinking about this. And it was about a year later, August of two thousand eight, that our very first projects were were happening. That we were there on the ground, and and it was it was transformational. It really was because yeah, I mean I think that we're. You know, and I'm not one of those angry activists that wants this all to feel like garbage uh, because uh, <laughs> because this isn't our problem. Uh, you know, I don't right, think that's right, I don't think right. that's the uh, the mm -hmm. perspective that we're trying to encourage. It's actually a much more optimistic one, which is, you know, we want. Yes, I take water for granted. Our hope is that we can get to a future where everybody can take water for granted. Uh, Come on. You know, and that's that's what we're we're looking for, because one of our volunteers says it really well. He said, hey. Here in the U.S. and in many parts of the West, we have the privilege of a thousand problems each. Yes, but in places like Uganda, sure. you only get one. Yeah, because some of those problems, you know, I'll, I'll play with the camera yeah. here. When, when you have one problem, you can't see anything else, right? Yeah, and uh, and so when when you have something like, you know, you don't have safe water in your life accessible to you each day that dominates your your time your energy your resources because yeah just like you said this this falls on certain demographics now i grew up in a big family i'm number 2 of 10 kids and wow. and i have seven <laughs> sisters and and two brothers and you know i'm the oldest son so if we were a ugandan family i would probably have an education and i would probably be you know successful because i was the oldest son I would have all, all the opportunity, but I'm well aware. I love my sisters. They are smart, intelligent, dangerous women making an impact in this world. I would hate to think about them not being able to pursue their dreams. I mean, I think about some wow. of what my sisters yeah. are doing. You know, I've got a sister who's got a master's in music pedagogy and she's an opera singer, right? Like that is not a career she'd be able to pursue at all if she was right. having to fetch water. And and mm -hmm. so it really is when you think about, again, going back to that image of the key there, you know, people, so many millions of people in Uganda and other countries are locked in bondage to this problem, you know, and, and it really is a spiritual problem because anything, you know, we, there is no, there's no separation between spiritual problems and practical problems. Anything mm -hmm. that gets in the way of our ability to live out the destiny that God has for us, the purpose he created for us for the the potential that he wove into who we are in christ anything that interferes with that is a is a spiritual problem and so we find that wow. these these practical problems like food insecurity water shelter um, agency is protected by the law i mean there's all kinds of very practical issues that really are a spiritual deterrent to you living the life you were created for and so we began wow. to see that, and that is part of the fire that burns in me and in my team as we work to have this, what has now become a very big impact. Wow. So like, and so this all started basically from just something very, very simple, right? So you're at a barbecue <laughs> and yeah. you're, 
and you're having a conversation with somebody who was uh, visiting for a, it was basically like a leadership conference kind of yep, a thing and exactly. somebody was visiting and and you connected and you you uh, you had this conversation and then what was what was sort of transpiring within you like w- did something go off right away where you just knew like almost right away like this is something that we need to be involved in or was it something that kind of brewed in you over time and uh you know to the point where you're like okay i can't unknow what i know now and now i've got it i feel like i have to do something like how did god sort of work on the inside of you to bring you to the point from having that initial conversation and then we're going to africa to actually you know get on the ground and see what's going on here for ourselves yeah i mean pretty early on once we just once we once i felt like i really had landed on hey here's a solution you know we could start with rainwater systems you know they're very simple mm. it's you're catching rain off the roof using gutters and into a big plastic cistern right it's it's not complicated and mm-hmm. once we had a picture of okay this is the solution fairly quickly i knew that i'm like i want to go and see what what this is all about i've always had that desire to you know to travel and to be present and to explore uh cultures and connections and so i knew i wanted to go but i will tell you being at that very first project uh i mean literally i got back duke i got back in the van after that day and i literally just sat back and my mind was just blown by you know it was like Mm. everything that was processing mentally emotionally spiritually physically and i said out loud wow i could do that a thousand times Wow. And so right away, I knew I'm like, this is big. And it was about a year later. No, not even. It was about eight months later. Um, you know, because at the time I, I had a job I loved. I was the assistant director for Isaiah Six Ministries. We had a, a, a great ministry team and that would travel around the Northeast United States, East Coast, doing, you know, worship concerts and yeah. evangelism. We do uh, church training. We do a lot of work with uh, young people and college students. We loved it. It was a great team. I loved being part of that team. I liked my role. You know, I was running the back end and uh, all of the production. But I was driving one day and I remember the Lord saying to me, you know, if you you're really busy right now, if you could only do one of the things you're doing, what one what would it be? And very quickly, I was like, you know, if I could only choose one, I'd love it if it could be building this thing, this Ugandan water project. Wow. And that was sort of a moment where I was like, all right, I'm going to have to trust the Lord for the timing and, you know, work with the leadership of the ministry I was part of to trust the timing for that. But I, that was the first day I was like, yeah, if the door opens for this to be all I'm focusing on, um, that would be a great day. Hmm. That's so cool. It's just, it's always fascinating to me how God leads us in different, you know, in different scenarios different situations of life and how like you were you know involved in one context serving the lord and doing your thing and apologize if anybody can hear the just started thundering pretty loud over here (laughs) but anyway um it's uh and then you're at a barbecue and you're you know just having a conversation with somebody and it just kind of sparks into this into this uh you know whole big thing that's now become a, a a life mission and something that you're going after and pursuing um if you would uh just to uh just for the benefit of, of anybody who's um just you know hearing about this for the first time um could you just maybe in your own words uh, give us a, a summary of what the mission is of yeah. the ugandan water project and what it is that that uh that your organization is really pursuing like yeah like the dream like what's right. what what's, does it look what's like? the dream what are yeah exactly yeah well again we we really we are exist to see Uganda as a nation set free from the bondage of, of waterborne disease and mm. water related poverty. And to that end, we're seeking to, to use the tools of water, sanitation and hygiene uh, to really uh, be a catalyst for these communities. Now, how, what is that? So that's the new future we're working for. But how are we doing it? We really focus on three areas. And, uh, and some of some people that might be familiar with us, how we started, this will sound a little bit different because it's, it's grown as we've grown. Okay. But basically the first focus is we really try to pro- address water access for today. So rural water projects that bring people safe water that don't have it right now. And that's a lot mm-hmm. of what you see. It's the rainwater systems, it's the hand pumps, it's restoring broken wells, gravity systems, water filters, right? The hardware. So water access today. And then we also recognize that 
we have to focus on sustainability. So we have a big focus on mm. water enterprises and sustainability for water sustainability tomorrow. It, it's mm. great to have it today. You've got to make sure it's running tomorrow. Yeah. And there's not a real a stable tax funded system like we have here for municipal water. So that's why we, we focus on water enterprise. And then the third area is system change, right? The, it's the advocacy, establishing standards, working with the government to figure out how they're functioning with organizations and vice versa. And that's system change to address water security forever. So it's a today, wow. tomorrow, forever that really looks at water projects, water enterprises, and water system change. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I just I I have so many questions. <laughs> yeah, dive in, man. Because I will say, I just you know it, it is a deep rabbit hole because that is some big big stuff, especially because most of what people see, especially on social media and things, you know, how do you see advocacy with the government? It's hard to see mm. that. What you see yeah. is you see us drilling wells, you see us building rainwater systems, things like that. But there's a lot more to what we're doing. Yeah. So like the sustainability thing is a is a big thing, right? Because mm -hmm. um you could go potentially go into an area and set something up that becomes for whatever reason outdated or becomes destroyed for whatever reason within six months or a year. Like right. I don't, I don't really have much of a, too much of a context for how all of this works. Right. But like when you, when you go into a new community, right. To set up a clean water supply, a clean water system. Yep. Um, I'm assuming it's not a one size fits all approach, right? Like you mentioned, yeah. there's rainwater collection, there's gravity. Um, I forget what you called it. Yeah. <laughs> I know what it flow is. Systems. Yeah. yeah. Gravity exactly. flow systems. There's drilling wells. There's all these different, yes. there's different things. Does that depend on the, is it like you, there's an, an initial assessment where you go in and you see what they have available to them, what might be happening underground right now. And right. then based on, Every, based on the conditions that are there um, in the in the community determines what kind of a system you put in place or yes, gosh, how does that you're, work? You're, you're halfway there already. <laughs> you know, I should put you on staff. Um, so yeah, basically uh, we, we have a, I mean, we have a fantastic team. We've got, we've got about 30 people on staff in Uganda, all Ugandans. We have wow. a, you know, they're, they're an amazing Mon. group. We've built them over Love time. That. And, uh, and so we have a monitoring and evaluation and learning team. And okay. they go into the community first and do an assessment and they do exactly what you said. They, they try to figure out, okay, what have you been doing for water? Because you can't be alive and not have water. So mm. what, what are you doing now? And what are the, what's the low hanging fruit? What are the opportunities? A lot of times we'll go into these, uh, these communities, Duke, and there's, there is a well, but it's broken. So someone drilled it. And for a period of time, it was great. Like that was mm. fantastic. They had safe water right there, but it broke and was never fixed. And so for situations like that, we're coming in and we're meeting with local leaders, doing community training to say, okay, let's talk about this. What happened? And sometimes it's hardware. You know, sometimes the contractor that drilled it used junk pipe and didn't do a very good job and didn't teach anybody how to take care of anything. And there wasn't a trained technician available in case there was repairs needed. Wow. And so, you know, that might be the problem. A lot of times it's a combination of hardware and what we call software, right? It's the relationships. Mm. Uh, hey, we had a hard time figuring out how to solve problems together. Or we, we don't, you know, back then the only option for sharing the expense was to literally put coins into a box. Well, we don't trust anybody to not take the money out of the box. Right. And, right. and so the great thing is now we have mobile money on, on our phones and we have transparency and security that we didn't have before. And even the hardware, we we no longer use low quality pipes that run real for stainless alloy, like high quality materials. And and so the combinations of better hardware, um, better tools to to protect trust and tr provide transparency we can now equip these communities to come in and we we do the repair work but we train them how to share this together and how to you know it's, it's using biblical principles of of mutual submission and servant leadership and 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 help them have a framework for how to care and share their water source and so that's a that's a a common expression of what we do we tie into local government with that 
you know, community health workers for training, the district water office for accountability. And it, it all comes together to really, you know, provide a catalyst for that community to grow. Mm. How, how much would you say is, uh, I guess, as far as like your actual presence um, there and, and the work that that the Ugandan Water Project is doing, how much would of it would you say is like going in and going into new communities and establishing new water sources um, and, and how much of it is maintenance? It, yeah. I don't know. Does that make sense the way I'm asking that? Yeah, absolutely. So so maintenance is something that's going to always be present, especially for mm -hmm. like, again, hand pumps. You know, gravity flow systems are pretty simple. There's not a lot of moving parts. Rainwater systems, same thing. But so many people are getting their water from hand pumps. And so you have moving parts that are designed sure. to wear out. I mean, they, right. they function just like many of the things you and I use in our daily life. You know, I have to maintain my car or it'll wear out, right? But if you maintain it, it lasts a very long time. So, you know, the maintenance burden is a perpetual burden. It should, it's, it's always going to happen. But it, if you can design things well, it's a reasonable burden for the community. And, uh, and so what we do once we let's say we repair a, a well or we drill a new well, our commitment is to walk with that community uh, in a transition of responsibility. So we're back there at six months, 12 months, two years, five years. And in between, they have access to us. We, our phone number goes on every every project. So yeah. if they have issues, if they have need, we're, we're available to support them. But we have scheduled interventions to make sure that things are functioning. It's not just to look at the hardware. It's about, hey, how are the relationships functioning? Come on. And, and we're continuing to work in their area. So it's not uncommon for us to, you know, uh, you know be driving to, to one location and we're like, hey, let's stop and see how these folks are doing. You know, we were there not that long ago. And so we'll fit these these extra visits in. But it's about the relationship of trying to build capacity in the community, help them have the tools they need, whether it's literal tools or access to professional skilled labor. And uh, and so we recognize that long term, even though we might be for the next 10 years doing new water projects over the long term, ongoing maintenance will be the the, the primary need. And, mm. uh, and that's why that's that middle leg of our focus is sustainable enterprise. So like we yeah. have a, a, a service business, it's a, it's a nonprofit business, but it's a service called Aqua Trust, right? It's about trying to provide trust for the community. That is a Ugandan entity that was founded and started with the intention of it out far outliving the U S charity. Mm. And it is you know, the, the intention is it will fill that gap for professional maintenance to serve those communities until a time when the government might have the capacity to do what, you know, what we see in our communities. You know, we have a village water, you know, uh, water uh, staff and we've got the infrastructure here, you know. So at some point we expect to see that in East Africa. But until then, we're going to have this main these maintenance type services that will really provide that, that, that bridge for the communities. Man, it's so cool. I, I love, I love, I love the fact that, um, you're partnering with people that are there, people that are, um, you know, you're partnering with people that are there that live in Uganda. Um, you're right. partnering with, uh, you know, people that, um, can go in. And I, I think that that is, um, just, so key to like the long-term sustainability of of a project and you know when you can work with the people that live there that live in the communities and sort of come alongside them in a way that's empowering to them where mm -hmm. it's not just like you're going to be dependent on this organization you know across the sea for the rest of your lives but uh, but to like put infrastructure and to put things in place that help them to be uh, empowered, you know what I mean? To, um, to really have, uh, a sustainable future in terms of, right. you know, water and health and, and stuff like yeah. that. I love it. Well, it's, it's interesting because when we first started, uh, you know, I would, I'll confess my own ignorance. I, I, I really didn't know what we were doing and, sure. uh, yeah. we made a lot of mistakes. And, uh, one of the mistakes I made early on was I avoided interacting with the government. I was like, 
oh, it's just red tape. We like to move fast. We like to, you know, we don't want anyone slowing us down with paperwork. You know, they're, we hear so many stories about, oh, the, the government's probably all corrupt anyways. And, <laughs> and so we just kind of flew under the radar. I mean, we were small, so it's not like they had anything to notice anyways. But, you know, what's interesting, Duke, is one day as, you know, the Lord really convicted me and basically said, what do you think my intentions are for government in Uganda? Hmm. And I'm like, you know, I pause. I'm like, okay, <laughs> well, you're probably intending to raise up righteous government and, and raise up leaders that are going to reflect your values and your purpose and, and be servant leaders in their communities. Like, yeah, yeah. And, and how often does my will be get done? I'm like, oh, yeah, you got a good track record, Lord. So all the time, it takes a while, but you get the job done. He goes, so yes, so there's a point. If you keep on your strategy of avoiding the government and laying low, and you're going to find yourself on a different page than me. Because, oh, wow. because I will raise up righteous government and I will establish servant leaders and all authority has been put in place by me. And so you, you got to be careful because you're heading in a slightly different direction than me. And it was convicting. And I was like, wow, we have to reorient. Mm. And, and it's still not easy because there is corruption. It's not complete cor corruption. There's plenty of amazing people serving in government in Uganda. But we had to humble ourselves and say, how? How can we enter into these relationships without compromising values? But wow. to recognize that this is part of what God's doing. And, and it's, it's, it was humbling, but it's really improved the way we can work. And you know, what's interesting is so many of us have sat in our churches in one way or another, whether our church is a coffee shop or a living room or a, or a building that, that uh, we commonly picture. And we've prayed for God to change the nations. But sometimes I feel like I've ignored after praying that the call to action of, well, then I suggest you learn the skills of nation building. Mm, well, you know, we want wow. God to change the nations. He usually does things through people. Yes. And there's a set of skills for changing nations and building nations. And sometimes they're very practical. And, you know, some people are like, how do you feel like you're in, you know, in missions or ministry when you're doing, you're running building crews and doing infrastructure projects? And, what? Uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> and I understand that a lot of people are like, they, you know, we have this mindset that if you're not out preaching the gospel or starting a church or leading a Bible study that you're not in ministry, but you know, when you look and go, Oh yeah, we're, we're like pouring concrete and laying brick and at government meetings, where's the ministry. But I'll tell you, you know, I, in this season, one of the verses that's rubber meets the road for us is mm. it is the kindness of God that leads to repentance mm. and kindness wow. is not always simple. Kindness is not always hugs and stickers. Yeah. Kind, kindness is sometimes intricately laid plans, strategically deployed to address very specific and widespread systematic suffering. Hmm. And that doesn't happen without having your act together and, and building capacity and expertise. Wow. And, and so we've, we've embraced that in the season of the kindness of God leading to repentance. Um, is part of what drives us. We want our kindness to be expertly deployed to take the love of Christ and incarnate it into these projects to serve the needs and stop the suffering for these communities. Oh, man, come on. <laughs> 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 take an, we need to take an offering right now, man. Yeah, there you go. Uh, no, it's so, it's so good. You know, like just meeting the needs, meeting, it's such a basic it's it's the most basic need of i mean i guess breathing right breathing it's number two it is number two you need oxygen more <laughs> but, you, you but die quicker without two. oxygen for sure that's right so you know yeah. but but beyond that yeah it's um it's it's right up there and yeah you know the pro providing something that's so basic that people need i love that i love that that's uh sort of the a, a driving force or that scripture that you shared on the kindness of God, you know, the kindness of God leading to repentance. And, you know, I could go into a village in Africa and be like, Hey, Jesus loves you. 
and uh <laughs> and not Prove that it. it would be out of place because it's yeah. true but yeah like you know what did jesus do what did Je jesus got into the trenches with people and he and he met their needs and yeah. very often he met their needs like before he told them to do anything you know yeah. what i mean and, and it was meeting people where they were at and so um i'd like i would love to come on your staff as like a just just to handle that just to handle those people that yeah. ask how can you <laughs> consider yourself a ministry or yeah. <laughs> or or you know what i mean how can you right. be a ministry when you're yeah you know i get it i i, I get i get where um you know where that idea or that where that concept comes from yeah but uh but this is ministry folks like like this is it and like i don't even you know i tell people all the time if you if you have a business if you, you know if you're an entrepreneur or you're a doctor or whatever you have like god's given you a ministry because he's given you an assignment and he doesn't separate secular from spiritual he doesn't you know he doesn't compartment our part compartmentalize our lives and it's only yeah. if you're like behind a pulpit and you're preaching that you know that that's what ministry is like yeah. you know ministry is when you um you serve people you know i think that's like the basic thing that it comes down to is serving people and i um i just love it so much i, I love um i just talked for the next 30 minutes about how much i love what you're <laughs> doing but um but but i i do want to if you could just like maybe um help us for anybody who maybe doesn't know what's going on like you know does it maybe it, for anybody let's just assume like there's somebody listening that this is the first they're you know really hearing of this like we know that there are people in the world who don't have clean water like we know that but sure. um there may be people who you know like me are just like unaware of the extent of the problem the, the yeah. extent of the of this um you know really major issue that's that's facing so many um nations of the world and a, a large percentage of people uh, you know a large percentage of our global population that don't have access to clean water or that can get clean water but it's a whole big ordeal to get it done and right. then they don't have enough of it to go around just the bare minimum basically for survival um, so if you could just maybe like um, help those people help me have a clearer perspective on, you know, yeah. what this actually looks like and the this the the grandness of this problem that we're yeah, actually and I facing. Think, I think it's you know, what I hear you what I hear you looking for is, you know, what does it actually look like in people's at real life? Because for we can sure. we can conceptualize it on a large scale. OK, th this is a problem we're aware of. But what does that look like to somebody who is trying to navigate? a specific moment today. Yeah. So like, well, yeah. And let me, let me, sorry yeah, to interrupt you, but like we can really be so disconnected from people. And I'm, so I'm glad you brought right. it there instead of just like the, the grand scale sort of thing. Um, because we can be so disconnected from like the, the individual person or the individual family that's, mm -hmm. you know, on the other side of the world from us right now. So we don't really have to think about it, but who's like, you know, maybe a, a mother who's um, lost several children to things like, you know, dysentery because there wasn't clean water, you know, for the, for their child or, you know what I mean? Like things right. like that. And so, um, yeah, please. Thank you for, for yeah. bringing it there. And, and, and so, you know, what does it look like? It looks like families that it is very common for your average family in Uganda to wake up. They woke, woke up today. And they had to send somebody to walk an hour to the local water hole. And, it, and very often it is literally just a hole at the bottom of the hill that they dug out to catch runoff from the surface. And mm. so it's, it's muddy and, and, it, and it's often, you know, young kids that are doing this, they're filling their jerry cans and, and those jerry cans, they're about five gallons each. They weigh about 40, 45 pounds and they have to haul those an hour back to their home. And once they get there, the, you know, the, you can't really drink the water because it's not safe. So you have to, you have mm. to cook the water, you have to boil it. So then the next chore is you've got to go find firewood or charcoal because you've got to boil this water on a fire. And wow. the, the fuel that was convenient got burned up years ago. And so you're often walking a long distance just to get fuel. Wow. And then you have to bring that water to a boil and cook it long enough so that the stuff that is in the water that wants to kill you is is dead and then and this is the part that uh you know a lot of people don't think about now you've got to wait for that water to cool so whereas you know my kids get home from school and the question they want to know is hey 
what can I have for a snack? Right. Like that's one of the most common questions mm. yeah, I asked when I was growing up, you know, I sure. get home, I'm like, Hey, can I get a snack? My the, kids immediately when right. I walk through the door, I'm like, didn't you eat lunch at school and have snack? Well, right. yeah. whatever. <laughs> so immediately. The, <laughs> the, but the question on people's lips when they get home from work or home from school in Uganda is, is water still hot? Because wow. if there was water for drinking, it's been boiled and you have to wait. It takes like three hours for a pot of water to get, you know, like sure. a five gallon pot of water. And so, so even just that, and then, and then the water is kind of smoky. It's not even like it's safe, but it's not like it's good. Mm -hmm. And, and so that's what people deal with. Uh, then there's all these anecdotes. Like I was at a school and the school director, he started this school himself because he's got a vision to educate children and he's doing his best. He's trying to build the, the classrooms that when he has a little bit of money for concrete and stuff. So they're just doing their best and they try to feed the kids one meal a day. And they had, we were there that day. So instead of just posho, which is like a corn mush, uh, they had rice. That was kind of nice, but he was genuinely embarrassed because we were walking around and I wanted, I, I'm insatiably curious. So I don't just want to walk around and see things. I'm like asking all kinds of questions. I'm taking uh -huh. a step into things. I'm looking at all, you know, and I see what they were cooking. I said, Oh, what are they cooking for lunch? And I could see shame fall on him hmm. because the only water that was available was muddy. And so the rice was muddy. Wow. And he was just so embarrassed that as much as he's trying to feed these kids, they're in a remote area of Rakai, mm. way out in the bush. He had to feed brown rice to his students and his guests because that's all they had. So there's moments like these that you don't even think about. Or we talked to, you know, COVID, right? The last year and a half been consumed with COVID. We've done so much work to help bring water to clinics. There are so many little small clinics and even some of the big health clinics in Uganda that didn't have safe water supply. We had a, a one of the doctors uh, we ran into um, at another meeting a, a few weeks after we did a, a project for them. We put a rainwater system for them and they said, thank you. We do. A, this is what the doctor was saying. We have a lot of uh, HIV, pediatric HIV cases in our community and wow. And they have to take, there's, you know, the World Health Organization provides medication and they have mm -hmm. to come to the clinic to take the medication on a regular schedule. And he goes, we've never had safe water at the clinic. So we have to have the kids chew the tablets. And he oh, said, you have man. no idea how, what a struggle it is to have a five-year-old with HIV and you have to sit them on their parents' lap and force them to chew medication on a regular basis. And he said, just having a safe drink of water to give them so they can swallow the medicine that's going to give them a future. Uh, and so there's all these moments that we don't think about, Duke. Yeah. That, that really, you know, I talk to teachers who are like, you know, they know that education is the one of the biggest indicators that impacts whether, whether young people will grow up and be able to have a better life than what they were born into. And and it's like trying to drive a car with no gas when you're trying to teach a, a mm. student with no water because water, you know, we, we know water, we're mostly water, right? There's a huge percentage of our body that's water. It's literally the fuel that our brain and our body systems work on. And so, I mean, one of the most arresting things that I learned a few years ago was about a, a, a thing called environmental enteropathy. And the common term is stunting. And when you have contaminated food and water supply, especially in the first five years of your life, your body goes into a chronic cycle of inflammation. you like your, your mm. GI tract, your digestive system. Wow. And it's a, your body's ability to draw nutrition out of food is altered because of all this cycle of sickness, sickness, sickness. And here's the, and it stunts you physically, which is why we see people from, countries like Uganda are smaller in stature mm. and it also stunts you mentally the ability to tackle complex reasoning and decision making uh is is wow. altered and diminished and this is the sobering thing because I'll be honest there was times where I was like hey we can't help everybody but we'll help as many as we can and we'll get to the others eventually but what lit a fire for us to be you know just pushing hard for this is when I found out that environmental enteropathy is irreversible. It is permanent. Oh. 
And so it makes a difference to people's entire life capacity. Yeah. Help them have safe water today versus next week or next month or next wow. year. And so when you look at our organization, one of the things that's unique about us is we work very, very fast. We mm. do more work in a month than some organizations do in a year. And, you know, we focus on how do we drive time better because we recognize the stakes. And so we say, hey, you know, McDonald's and FedEx don't happen to be fast. It's who they are. And so we embrace that as the challenge for our identity of we want to work with urgency because the stakes are so high. So that's a little flesh on the bones for what does it look like yeah. for families to wake up or people to go through their life. And what hit me was these statistics. It's not that 700 million people don't have access to clean water. It's that one person the one. doesn't have water mm -hmm. and that's happening 700 million times a day. Oh. <laughs> yeah i'm on the soapbox today baby Man. I, I mean we this is what this is what keeps us going i mean it's been 14 years and i'll yeah. tell you you know I, I mentioned earlier when i got back in the van after project number one i said i could do that a thousand times two weeks ago we hit a thousand projects come on yeah so we've, we've now done a thousand major projects we're hoping oh. to continue to do two to three to four hundred a year in the coming years so we're, Come on. we're getting gaining speed and uh and we're part we're collaborating with other organizations because we we really believe that this is a this is a solvable problem in uganda within the decade come on yeah i read somewhere it might have been on the facebook page um mm -hmm. but i read that the, you have something like 200 or so communities that you're already approved to be able to yeah. go into or something like that and basically yeah. just waiting on is it just waiting on resources like yes. or the, the next, uh, you know, the next sort of go ahead? Um, so like when you have a community that's so you have a list of communities that you've been approved mm -hmm. for that you can go into, you can go into any one of these tomorrow. Right. Essentially. Uh, in New York State, we would call the government would call it shovel ready projects. OK, <laughs> shovel ready. Projects. Yeah, they are All shovel right. ready. Let's go. Yeah. So um, how what? I, I I imagine it varies, but like what's sort of like the average, like, so in order to be able to go into, to select one of those communities that you're going to go into tomorrow, yeah. what is sort of the base like budget that's needed in order to, to get there and to fund that project? Yeah. That's one of the exciting things. Is or you, it, you don't have to be super exact if you can't or whatever. It's, you know, completely up to you, but yeah, <laughs> we actually have disciplined ourselves to be able to, because I think it, you know, it isn't just about us doing work. It's about us. Be, we are the bridge between people like you and and the people in our communities that want to make a difference and the impact that is needed. And so we say, hey, if we can make sure it's it, people know, hey, it's going to cost this much. It's going to take this much time. And this is the impact that makes it accessible. So our pro major projects range. Uh, most of them range from two to ten thousand dollars. But mm -hmm. it's we're, we're we've really dialed it in so we can consistently do them, you know, again and again and again on budget. So we can restore a broken well in a community for two thousand dollars and that'll impact about 500 people. And we can put a rainwater system uh, on a, a community building like a church, a school, a clinic. We can do that for thirty five hundred dollars, thirty six hundred dollars. Okay. And that impacts two hundred and fifty to three hundred and fifty people. And we can drill a new well. Drilling is a lot more complex and drilling is a lot harder. Um, that costs on average nine to 12,000. Most of the time it's around 10,000. Uh, you know, it depends on how deep you have to go, but it's a, usually around $10,000 and it takes a little bit longer. Most of these projects, you know, the, the restoring wells and doing rainwater systems, we can complete that from dollar to done in 60 days. Uh, it takes a little bit longer with drilling because there's, uh, it's, you know, it's just a more complex system. Sure and, sure. and then we're just starting to to get into solar pumping you know, where we can take a high production well and we can put a solar pump on that and an elevated tower. And then that can feed out to the community. And that that's a bigger project that in addition to the cost of drilling is another, you know, 10 or twelve thousand dollars. So it's stop and think money. It's it's not like, oh, yeah, I'm either buying lunch or I'm buying a community water. Right. Right. But the, the amazing thing is with purpose and resolve, we have seen 
you know, individuals, families, businesses, churches, schools. I mean, goodness gracious, Clarence Middle School out near Buffalo, New York, over the last three weeks, their seventh graders just raised $12,000. No way. Yeah. Come on. You know, and, and another school, you know, we were down in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, you know, and we saw some of the schools down there raise three to $5,000. You know, they're, they are saying, hey, we want to put water at a school you know, from school to school. It's, it's stop and think money, but it's accessible. We can do it. And we can, you know, it goes to a specific place. You see the GPS, you see the pictures. And, and what we realize in doing that is our organization doesn't just believe in the impact in Uganda. Mm. We believe in the impact here because we're inviting people. I want you to That's understand right. that you have the ability to impact one of the most persistent problems on the planet and help unlock freedom for people. We want people here in our communities to understand their potential to create change. And we want them to have the, the experience of coming together because sometimes it's just an individual doing it, but a lot of times it's us coming together and saying, hey, let's turn love into cash and cash into water and water into freedom. Come on. Oh, I love that so much. <laughs> Man. All right. So regardless of, um, you know, depending on what you do, whether it's going into community and it's a it's a there's already a well, but it's broken. So the well's being repaired or it's rainwater collection or mm -hmm. it's the gravity system, you know, whatever, yeah. whatever's whatever's happening. Is the water always coming from like, is it always rainwater that that's it, like, are there situations where you have to bring in water from outside because the community itself is not set up like they, yeah. they don't they like no matter what you do, you they can't access it like they can't either drill deep enough to get to it or like, is that ever an issue? And then also, like, I guess the climate and the weather yeah. and things like that would probably come into play, too. Right. So. Sure. Yeah. So when we're drilling, that that's where when we're drilling, we're accessing groundwater. You know, the, it's, it's mm -hmm. deep under the ground, usually 100 feet or more. Um, and so that's a different you know, we we have to do a survey into the ground to identify whether there's that potential, you know, Uganda is on the equator, so there is quite a bit of rain in Uganda. So rainwater isn't as effective, say, even if we went north to north to uh, South Sudan, which is just north of us, not nearly as effective. Um, okay. But you know, your your sobering question of are there communities where our tools still don't produce a solution? Um, yeah, there are. I mean, there are some situations where we're like, okay, uh, I mean, rainwater in Uganda always has some impact except in the north where it's a lot drier. Um, but if we're trying to drill, we, we, we're we facing a, a situation right now. There's a region where the water is very deep. Uh, so you have to go 120 meters. Well, at 120 meters, a hand pump doesn't work. Mm. So you're talking, okay. you know, four, over 400 feet. Yeah. Um, because it, literally just the when you're cranking that handle, it doesn't have the ability to lift and hold suction. It's The water is too heavy. It's too deep. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so uh, basically around 90 meters, a hand pump, that's the limit. So the water is uh, more than 120 meters down. So it's down there, but now you have to spend a lot more money to use an electric pump. The other challenge is it's really high in iron. So like okay. dangerously high. Okay. And this is not like, you know, when I went to my uncle's house, we, growing up, we'd go visit my cousins and their sinks always had a rust stain in them and the water tasted a little metallic. I'm not, I'm not talking about just a little tinge of iron. I mean, mm -hmm. dangerously high. And, uh, and so right now we're facing the challenge of, okay, we managed to drill the well, we managed to put in an electric pumping system, and we even put in two iron reduction filters and it's still outside of the safe range. And so right now we're like, okay, you know, there's, there's things you can do, but not usually at small scale. Okay. Because that's the challenge is, okay, we know how we'd handle this in the States, but it's also funded by taxes. And here you've got hmm. a community of a thousand people and they can't afford the solutions that we're, so we're right now, you run into some of those kinds of situations where you're like, we really don't know. And so, yeah, it's not like you can just throw money at it. You, you know, it takes expertise and collaboration. We're talking to a couple other organizations right now who, you know, trying to see if they have ideas of 
how do you solve this problem with simple materials that are available in Uganda and that the maintenance and operational costs are affordable to this community? So wow. it's tough. It's not easy work. That is one of the puzzles yeah. we're dealing with right now. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's amazing. You know, you, you really don't realize how much you need water, I guess, until you don't have it right. And until you or until there's a yeah. shortage or until, you know, we've all probably been through one situation or another where, you know, yeah. you've gone through a hurricane or a bad storm or something yep. like that, where like you're not allowed to drink the water right now you yeah. have to boil the water you can't cook with you know what i mean like there's you know we've all gone through those things that usually last for like a few days right maybe a couple of weeks if it's a really you know devastating situation but um you know for the most part I, you know i think that um you said something earlier about how you know we get to have we have the luxury of having all of these problems <laughs> you know and then in other parts of the world you know certain people in different stages of life it's like i, I only have I, I I can't even think about having all the like right. there are people that would that would that would kill to have the problems that you and I have right. today. You know what I mean? To for that to be their focus um or for that to be an issue in their life. But it's like uh that doesn't even come up because you know when you're struggling for survival, you know, when you're you know, when it's uh when you don't have access to something that's so basic for you know every need of life, you know, um I I very recently I heard a story that that helped to sort of put in my mind like to sort of understand and I obviously I can't understand it as far as you know um personally but to to sort of have a better um understanding of like what water poverty is really all about mm. um and so there's this uh and I believe I believe it was um in Ethiopia um where the this story came from but this young girl teenage girl um, they didn't have clean water in her, you know, in her village, in her community. So she would literally, she would have to walk. It was eight hours a day, you know, I guess four hours there, four hours back, eight hours a day where, um, you know, she would go, she had a clay water pot and she would go and she'd fill up her, her water pot and she'd, and she'd walk. So eight hours a day, she's yeah. walking, um, teenage girl, obviously she's not able to go to school or anything like that. And, uh, one day on her way home, she's got her water, she's on her way back. Um, I don't know how close she was to being back to her village, but um, she slipped and she fell and the water pot, she broke the water pot um, and obviously lost all the water. And it was she couldn't even fathom. She just couldn't imagine going all the way back. Well, actually, she wouldn't have been able to because her water pot was broken anyway. Um, but and, and, and I'm sorry for everybody. Let me just give you a disclaimer. This is like a really sad story. Um, I should have said that from the beginning, but, um, this, this young girl, um, she actually, um, she found a rope and she hung herself from a tree, um, on, on the, you know, on that trail going back to her home. And when they, uh, when her friends were asked, um, you know, by, by an outsider, by an American who was uh, working in the area and visiting, um, when her friends were asked, why, why do you think she killed herself? They said, because of shame. Right. Um, she would have been too too ashamed to go back home, um, knowing that she could not um, give water to her family. Because I mean, yeah, my my, you know, your kids, my kids, they probably slip and fall every day of their lives, you know. Right. And uh, in, in an accident, uh, you know, an accident that happened, she obviously she wasn't intending to do sure. it. But but that idea, that thought of shame was so great. And it and. You know, and the like the they said too, probably even the fact that the water pot was broken yeah. and that was something that wasn't uh, that's not a simple thing either, because they're, you know, as far as um, in this kind of a community, that's not something that we would that would be considered cheap to right. get a new one of. And, um, you know, so for a family in that situation, she just couldn't even fathom going back home and facing her family with with no water. Right. And um, so her solution was uh, to to take her own life. And yeah um it sort of helped it sort of like put something in my brain that I, I you know we think about the situation like okay they don't have water so dehydration and there might be some issue but how it truly affects every single area of life and um you know like getting yeah. back to what you were saying before um if if you're you can you know you can go in and you can talk to some of these you can tell these people about jesus or you can you know go in and you can do different things but um, the probably like even the mental capacity to be able to 
take in new information when this is like the situation that so that people are actually facing right it's just like until you meet that physical need um you know again like the most basic need of life it's uh you know how how much impact are you are you really going to have you know what i mean yeah it's, it's it's really true you know we we really have to see that it's all connected you know it it is it's all connected this is this is the the spiritual need of these people uh is in this case you know to have their water poverty addressed and that is the key that unlocks that that bondage and and the there as much as so much there's a lot of heavy weight to what we've been talking about <laughs> sure <laughs> but the truth is there's there's so much optimistic out you know outcome to look at too like reality is we are seeing a huge impact you know there are there's, you know, 300,000 people that wake up every day because of the work that we've done and they have water security now. And, mm. and there are so many people that we're going to be helping as we work to help change the way that the, you know, things work to help equip the government with the tools they need. And, you know, there's wow. like, we're working together with other organizations to improve how we do this work. And, and the truth is like, there are so many communities here in, in the United States and families and individuals who have had that experience of saying, oh, yeah, I make a donation and then it actually ch impacts real people's lives. Very yeah. Quickly. And so as much as it really is sobering to feel the weight of it, it's not something that it, we have to be stuck with. It mm. is solvable. You know, it's, it's interesting because, uh, you know, the, the bottled water industry, you know, the value economically of the bottled water industry is far greater than what it would cost to provide safe water for those that don't have it. And I don't say mm. that to make people feel guilty for knocking back a Dasani or a Poland Springs. Right. I say that to be encouraging to say, hey, we already have it. We, we can already afford it. And, and so it really is about inviting ourselves into an examined choice to say, hey, I want to be part of expressing compassion and kindness to meet a basic need, to see people set free, and, you know, for us, it's in a place like Uganda where we can see the finish line. It is not that far away. And and this is something you can make a measurable difference, uh, whether it you know, and, and you can invite everybody in your life to be part of it. This is something that doesn't matter, mm -hmm. you know, what your background with faith is. People understand, oh, yeah, I want, you know, kids at schools in Uganda to have clean water. I want communities in Uganda to have clean water. It, it is a, a first step of love that is a wide door that says, come on in, have an encounter with serving people that have a need and watch what love does in every direction. When you spill water, it flows in every direction. When, mm -hmm. when you're part of the process of providing water, there's impact that's made in all directions as well. And so that's what we love about it. So as much as we talked about a lot of heavy stuff today, dude. Sure, sure, sure. What I want people to be left with is just this idea that if this is something that resonates with you, you can be part of actually solving this problem. And you, you know, most of us, we have the opportunity to see this stopped in our lifetime. This should be the last generation of children that walk for water and we can do something about it. So if you do want to be part of that, is that, that's something that you're like, Hey, I need to know more. I want to get involved. Uh, you can see, you know, our website is ugandanwaterproject.com and you can look us up online. It's pretty straightforward. You can find us on, you know, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, or you can shoot us an email at info at ugandanwaterproject.com. But we are ready to collaborate with you. We're ready to work with you. We believe in the impact this will have, not just in Uganda, but in your life, in your community. And, uh, and I just, I'm just excited because we are seeing it happen. That's so good. Um, what what are what are some of the ways that people can get involved, James? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's great. You know, we see people um, host events in their area. You know, we, I, you know, sometimes it's done remotely. Sometimes I travel to help participate in those or other people on our staff. If you want to bring people in your community together to learn and to take action, uh, people can volunteer to to be part of those events. If you're in the uh, Rochester, New York area, you can uh, certainly volunteer in our office. Uh, there are opportunities to host water project campaigns to 
to uh, whether it's through a business, a school, a, or a family, a neighborhood. And so we can guide you through that. We do a lot of school engagements. If you want, if you're a teacher or a, if you're a family that's part of a school, we love working with schools. Um, but uh, and and there are opportunities to to volunteer to go on a trip to Uganda. We don't do a lot of that. Uh, we aren't the you know show up with a a, a, a Greyhound bus packed with uh, visitors. Right. But we do put select teams together once or twice a year to go into the communities and learn about this work and participate in it. Um, and uh, there's a couple of those that happen. Uh, you know, it hasn't been the same the last year or so, but uh, there is sure. opportunity to actually go. And uh, especially if you've got any specific skills that that would help solve, you know, constraints that we're facing, you know. If, I could really use someone to train my team on better welding skills, for instance. Um, right. But, so there's yeah. a lot of ways there, you know, we look at it and say, Hey, this is one of those things that you don't have to, you don't have to preach, teach, and you know, all those things. Some people with very simple skills that are very practical. Um, there's a place in this work for you to come and help add value. So all, all sorts of ways, reach out to us. We'd love to dialogue with you. We're pretty collaborative. That's so good. So yeah, you guys can go to ugandanwaterproject.com to really just even uh, to find out more about the mission and the vision and the heart behind what's going on and uh, to see ways that you can also you can also partner um, in your giving, right? Like if you want to make yep. a donation, if you want to, uh, I know there on the website, you can um, set it up to to make a monthly contribution or you can do a yep. one time um, gift as well. And, uh, you know, so that's a really simple, you know, really simple way that anybody who maybe can't go or can't whatever um, can get involved uh, right from home, too. Absolutely. And um, and and James, like, so what if somebody just, uh, you know, like you said, the welding thing or just something like that? Somebody's got a creative idea, creative solution or, or has an idea that they think might be able to help you guys out or, you know, yeah. something like that. Um, is there a way that they could get um, in contact with you or with your team? Yeah, absolutely. The best thing to do is, is to email info at ugandanwaterproject.com. Now, it sounds very generic, but the reality is, uh, you know, that is where we look at it and go, okay, this is for, you know, this person, this goes to that person. So we can really traffic cop that the requests and interest and, and ideas to the right people on our team um, so that, you know, it, we can really handle those inquiries and really you know, get the right person on the other end of the line with you. So we'd love to do that. And and yeah, as we head into the, the end of the year, you know, hey, if you're saying, hey, hey, for Christmas, let's let's do let's have a clean water Christmas. If you want to make a donation and and sponsor a specific water project, that's such a doable thing. Uh, you know, take a look at our site and you can see the options. And that's something we we see a lot of people respond to. There's time to receive a gift now and get that in the works so that people will be hearing in communities in Uganda, Hey, someone said yes to water for Christmas this year. So we'd love to, we'd love to hear from some people that are dreaming about that, but thanks so much, Duke. It's been awesome to chat with you, man. This is just so exciting and looking forward to seeing uh, just where things, where things grow from here. Yeah, James, I really do. Again, I really appreciate you. I appreciate your time and just sharing about, um, what you guys are doing and it just, it's, I, I can't, I don't know. I can't even, the, the words aren't even there, man, to really, um, express how important the work is that you're doing. And I just really appreciate, you know, the, the way that, um, that you and so many others who have partnered with you have really just given their lives, um, in service of humanity have really, you know, give and are giving, giving your lives, you know, to, uh, to serve people in such a practical way um, as, you know, providing such a valuable resource that, again, we take it for granted. And I've, I've loved listening to uh, your hopefulness in all this and, um, you know, not getting bogged down by like uh, the, you know what I mean? The, the problem yeah. and the challenge of it and, and, uh, and stuff like that. But, but recognizing again, like I think the, the most key thing that you've said over and over throughout this conversation is this is a solvable problem. This is a fixable problem. Right. And um, and I just love I love that there's people like you that exist uh, in this world that, you know, can rally the rest of us together to say, OK, let's let's attack this in a tangible way, in a practical way so that we can really bring, you know, freedom into the lives of people and help people um, have a sustainable future. Okay. And so, again, really, really appreciate it, man. So thank you so much. Uh, any final thoughts or words or anything like that before we go? Just never underestimate your ability to actually make a difference in this world. You know, there was a time where I knew nothing about the water crisis 
and now I lead a fantastic group of folks that are recognized as experts. And, uh, and so just recognize by, by, you know, paying attention to what the Lord puts in front of you and moves your heart with, uh, you know, you, you'd be amazed if you start to just believe that he can use you to make a difference in the world. Wow. So good. Oh, I love it. I love it. Well, thank you again, man. And thank you everybody uh, who took the time to watch or listen to this episode. Really appreciate you guys as well. Make sure you go to ugandanwaterproject.com and uh, just find out more about what's going on. Look for ways that you could be a part. And uh, if, if um, yeah, if nothing else, um, just see what the Holy Spirit would put on your heart as far as um, a donation. Um, and, uh, you know, again, it's a really practical way, um, that, uh, that we can get involved and support. So, um, so thank you everybody. Uh, if this episode blessed you or add any value to your day, if you would, uh, maybe share it with somebody, someone that you, that you know, that you think maybe needs to know a little bit about more about what's going on, um, in this area of the world as well, that would really be appreciated. So, um, thanks so much, James. Thank you again, brother. Really appreciate you. Absolutely. Great to be here. Yeah. Thanks. Take care, bud. All right.